And hello, everyone. We are back in the University of the Underground, a university and charity founded in 2017. I am Naum, uh, the head of program of I Want to Believe, where we are exploring religion and belief systems in connection to politics, society, nation states. I would like to welcome our researchers uh, and also to uh, visiting participants. I see that some of you are around. So we kindly ask you to donate whatever you can to the university so we can keep running these programs and support our lecturers. Um, today we're going to have a 40 minute talk followed by a 15 minute Q&A with two, uh, of two guests. One is Chloe Macari Carney and Alexandra Belova. So there's a lot to say about them, but I'll try to to just touch the key points. So Chloe, um, da, 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 uh, she, she's working in the question of gender since 2018 with, with a project of a nomadic and experimental space called Woman Cave. Uh, but since March uh, 2021, uh, with, the, with a collective of the same name, they published a book dedicated to the question of the place of women in architectural space in the space of the city. And then we also have Alexandra Belova, uh, who has a master in religious studies. And now uh, she's finishing a, a master's in anthropology of globalization in, in Paris. And her master's thesis focuses on the ethnography of sacred feminine circles which uh, she examines through the lens of new age religion and contemporary ritual theories. So it's a really interesting connection, both of you and your background. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so we are going to share with you the screen. Can you see that? Yes, it's working. Okay. Great. Um, Est-ce qu'on mm -hmm. fait full screen? En tout cas, c'est OK. Oui, ça va. OK. Um, so, hello. Yes, I am Chloe. I'm an architect. And this is Alexandra, an anthropologist. And we're both uh, coming to you from Paris, France. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the sacred um, feminine circles called uh, the red tents. Uh, we've each been studying them for several years, me through the angle of space and architecture and Alexandra through sociological research and interviews. And actually it's through this space that our practices collided when we met during a sacred red tent circle group in Paris in 2019. So um, Alexandra is, as you said, a Russian anthropologist of religion and spirituality, and she was conducting site research for her second master's um, that she's doing right now in Paris. And um, oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's who we are. <laughs> And, um, and I was also conducting research in the framework of the Women Cave Project, which, as you said, is a nomad safe space for discussing the question of gender and architecture. Um, and so now I'm a licensed architect and I've been working um, uh, on this project through uh, the Women Cave Collective that Alexandra is also a part of. Yes. And uh, uh, hello, everybody. I have been developing a research on this topic for my second master, as already said, uh, I think, uh, uh, three times. And uh, now <laughs> I'm finishing it. And uh, we are going to start our presentation with little of context. And uh, the Red Tents, uh, they have uh, part of the New Age culture. And we will describe this culture for you a little bit so much you know much debate on secularization and the problems of uh, desecularization in the contemporary world has given rise to a particular tradition of exploring the some subtle phenomena of our time so-called holistic spirituality or the new spirituality or simply new age which is referred to phenomenal of this sphere. So the term 
New Age could be defined as a set of uh, spiritual Western currents of the 20th and 21 centuries. And, uh, you know, the definition is uh, uh, still greatly debated. Uh, for example, you can see three definitions like Marilyn Ferguson in her book, The Children of Aquarius, defines it as a new cultural paradigm, uh, heralding a new era in which humanity will succeed in realizing an important part of its potential, psychic, psychic and spiritual. Or in the most general form, the social phenomena related to this sphere can be recognized by a number of characteristics presented by uh, a researcher Walter Honeygraph. The basic symbolism, uh, uh, I sit, <laughs> the basic symbolism of the self is linked to a basic mythology of grown self development of the individual soul through many incarnations and existences in the sense of increasing spiritual knowledge and uh, discernment. And finally, it is, in fact, uh, as we all know, uh, the people who make research about it, it is New Age the product uh, of modernity. Indeed, Paul Hillis emphasizes that the spiritual thought attracts because its teachings are in tune with widely held cultural assumptions. Uh, on the surface, many of these teachings may seem strange. In fact, they express beliefs and values that illustrate deeply rooted cultural trajectories. So, um, so where uh, one might think that New Age is a form of hippie uh, counterculture of the 60s or 70s, uh, for example, in that you could kind of observe in the movie Hair with the scene, the opening scene with the Age of Aquarius, um, its principle of self-actualization actually echoes the capitalist dogmas, which advocate constant self-improvement, leading to better returns, better productivity. So it's not really that, that um, far off from uh, modernity. And this is also the idea of the self-made man of the American dream. Today, this counterculture seems to uh, have become a global wellness market that is very popular, widely accessible. And um, I mean, we all know by now that well-being has become a really big hit in the market. And as a matter of fact, even since the beginnings of the New Age counterculture, some partisans profited greatly off organizing trainings and workshops that would also not improve your personal life, but also your financial well-being. Uh, for example, you see here Werner uh, Erhard leading a, a six-day, 60-hour course that was aimed to transform one's ability to experience living so that the situations one had been trying to change or had been putting up with would clear up just in the process of life itself. So that was a citation of um, a quote from the description of this training uh, that he created in 1971. But still to this day, you can find um, similar ideas in the various self-help books that you see here on the screen. Uh, furthermore, in a globalized economy where we now have access to cultures from all around the world uh, with internet and um, uh, social network services, uh, the New Age spirituality takes from multiple sources, uh, rewrites ancient histories of gods and sages and intertwines them in a spiritual realm that is, is, that is less strict or rigid than, for example, traditional Catholicism or Judaism. The New Age is a self-spirituality that is centered around self-healing. It's very individualistic. And such an individual, individualistic manner of seeking salvation and betterment allows each and everyone to create their own spirituality, which is why it's so hard for us to describe um, what exactly New Age is and to pin it down. It's really a product of this globalized postmodern economy. Mm -hmm. And now a few words about feminine spirituality. Indeed, it is this is this spirituality is situated in this realm of the new age no mixed spiritual groups where only women gathered uh, originated in the late 60s while a feminist spiritual movement or goddess movement appeared in the us europe and australia and 
spiritual feminism combined uh, protests against patriarchal social order and commitment to Wicca, a form of neo-paganism that gained some popularity in the mid 50s. In the decades thereafter, the goddess movement continues to exist independently of Wicca, although the texts and practices characteristic of the latter continue to circulate within the movement. Actually, this uh, tendency to speak of witches to affirm that you are a witch today is synonymous with saying that you are a feminist and contemporary feminist literature <laughs> has created a tendency around this figure of the witch who is seen as a liberated woman who doesn't care about the expectation that society has on her. For example, in the common imagery, uh, the witch has moles. She has wrinkled skin and lets her gray hair grow long. She lives alone in the forest. She is scary and wild and unpredictable. And the very um, phallic symbol of the broomstick is also very poignant. She can take her broomstick and whatever she pleases with it, she has the power over her movement, she can leave any situation when she's upset or, or wants to go somewhere else. Um, so this figure was recently revived, at least in France, with um, the book Sorcière of Mouna Cholet in 2018. But we've also seen it come back up with the TV show uh, Sabrina, um, which was originally a 90s hit, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Or we've also seen this figure come up in a lot of protests, for example, the witch block protests um, uh, in September in 2017 for the right to abortion. Um, and even what's interesting, too, is if you look at the 1989 Ghibli film Kiki's Delivery Service, in French it's translated as Kiki the Little Witch. And here she's cute, but she's still wild and makes her own money. She's very independent at a really young age. Yes, and uh, we know today that women's new spirituality at the early stage already was very closely associated with political activism, along with other countercultural initiatives of the time. The goddess for the women involved uh, was both an alternative to repressive Christianity and a way to talk about themselves outside the established gender roles. Actually, around this time, in 1975, American architect Mimi Lobel drafted up the Goddess Temple, which you see here, in the Rocky Mountains. It's an architectural celebration of the feminine principle planned to accommodate sacred feminine rituals. So you see here the, the, the form of the circle, and she tries to kind of visualize what femininity would be with more rounded spaces, for example. And in 1985, with artist Christina Biaghi, she also develops the Goddess Mound, which you see here. Uh, so these spatial projects, which were never built, show as well how this figure of the goddess served as an inspiring and poignant feminist icon for women, thinkers at the time who were searching for new paradigms by designing new spaces and experiences uh, really for the woman. Yes, and uh, the inspirers and participants of this goddess movement freely combined elements from different religions and philosophical traditions, as you can see here. For example, ancient Greek and Hindu goddesses, neo-pagan rituals, the concept of karma and Jungian archetypes became, after that, something inherent, not only to the goddess movement, but also to the whole New Age culture. So far, Eclecticism remains a characteristic of new women's spirituality and the feminist component also plays a key role in Western societies. There are actually different approach to study the female question in the context of modern spiritual practices. Thus, Carolyn Crowley, having provided a detailed ethnography of similar phenomena in the USA, and she comes to the conclusion that such practices are devoted to forming an identity and a source of spiritual power. In a similar way, Ursula King, uh, a bit earlier in the 90s, highlighted that spirituality is not a permanent retreat from the world into the monastery, the desert, the cave, 
but arising out of the midst and depth of experience. Spirituality implies the very point of entry into the fullness of life by bestowing meaning, value, and direction to all human concerns. According to King, a spiritual search is necessary in order to find the meaning of one's existence, the meaning of woman's self-realization and in an intricate social context. Another sociologist, uh, Linda Woodhead and Eva Sointru, justify uh, the popularity of New Age practices among women. According to them, spiritual groups provide an opportunity to simultaneously legitimize the existing gender order and rebel against it. This allows women to resolve a fundamental dilemma of their existence, which I think everybody knows. Uh, it's life for themselves or life for others. Woodhead makes a point that the interest in alternative spirituality is intrinsic to middle-class white women who are forced to juggle their domestic and work responsibilities. Those women find in, in alternative spirituality a reflection of their everyday life and uh, hence a tool for influencing it. Finally, a European researcher, Chia Longman, uh, studied women's circles in Western Europe, points out, points out that circles not only offer a space for women to explore and craft their femininity through making self connections that emerge through spiritual well-being embodied practices, but also making other connections through sharing stories, rituals, emotions, and touch. And now, finally, uh, after this brief uh, historical and bibliographical uh, excursus, we will focus on our field, the red tent. Uh, what is that? An experience designed. Uh, um, well, the red tent may be considered, as we said uh, earlier, the part of this new age movement in 1997. Anita Diamant published a book which is titled The Red Tent and henceforth inspired the worldwide movement of feminine sacred circles for discussion. This book also became a TV miniseries primered in, uh, on Lifetime in 2014. It tells the story of Dina, the only child of Jacob, who is only attributed a few words in the Bible. The history and origins of these circles was created and often reinterpreted, and we will develop on that in a little bit. According to a legend circulating in these communities, uh, women in the age of matriarchy would gather every month during a new moon. Because of this, today, some circles actually occur on the day of the new moon, under the red tent, forbidden for men, of course, women would meet during their periods and talk about their lives, love, share their secrets, give birth to children, etc. In fact, Anita Diamond admitted in an interview that whereas some may say the story comes from biblical times, um, it's not the case. I said, uh, I have not found any evidences showing that women have in this period of history and in the area of former Iraq, Israel set up menstrual tents. However, menstrual tents and hunts are found in different pre-modern cultures across the world, in America as well as Africa. The story of what happened inside these tents comes entirely from my imagination. So here you can see actually a few uh, menstrual huts. On the left is Anita Hut, also called Margam Godos. I'm probably pronouncing it really wrong. Um, uh, used by uh, the women of a Jewish community in Ethiopia. Uh, go to this hut when they're menstruating until they can uh, purify themselves and then return back to their community or their house. 
And actually these um, huts are quite, uh, have made a buzz a few years ago because in, in Nepal, for example, the Chapan, Chapoji huts are um, actually illegal, they're banned. It's a practice that is quite dangerous for the women because they're relegated to a space that is uh, usually where the cows are stored, for example, and they're meant to stay there for a few days. Sometimes they die of dehydration. And in 2019, uh, a woman and her two sons died in one of these huts. So even though this movement kind of glorifies this space centered around menstruation, there are actually a lot of huts of this sort that aren't very glorious uh, for or empowering for women. So it's to be taken with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And today, of course, we are sharing um information based on our experience of participating in the Red Tents of Paris, but these details could be applied to the movement in general. Red Tent Group of Paris organizes between four and five gatherings per month in different districts of uh, Paris, led by different women who must be initiated to animate the circle, either by the creator of the Red of the Tent Rouge in Paris or by one of the facilitators. To be able to attend a circle, you have to first register to be on the newsletter email list, which is sent out every so often with the dates and the locations of uh, the upcoming events for the months. You then email back directly to the facilitator to, of the event you want to go to. Preferably, this must be done straight away as the demand in Paris is quite important and the waiting lists are long. Once registered, women go to the meeting place where the facilitator prepares a space for the gathering at a specific time. Uh, so what, what we find really interesting is that the, the tools of this ritual, the space and this format of dialogue is not, none of this is random. It's definitely designed. It's calibrated and designed for a desired result, which is to create a new world, this famous new age. And the women who come don't know each other. They're complete strangers. And they share the moment of the circle with each other. And then they leave uh, with a feeling of uh, reassurement, with the impression of having been heard, listened to, and supported. The organizers of this uh, these gatherings speak of goddesses, of sacred feminine, all that we've uh, just uh, mentioned. And they mix up a whole set of archetypes that they um, that they don't necessarily master. Well, according to the widely shared mythology of the sacred feminine, the idea of cyclicity is central. One woman, for example, I met with Florence of uh, 35 years shared how women at the hormonal level follow the lunar cycle. The lunar cycle is associated with menstruation which must be taken into account. Therefore, sacred femininity is associated with the secularization of the womb. However, the subject discussed during the gathering remained fairly earthly. And yet, as we convinced, the success of this practice is very much linked to the sensory aspects that we are going to present to you. So we're gonna look here at how this space is a designed spiritual experience, uh, experience with social outcomes. And I would even endeavor to say that there are therapeutic, there's a certain therapeutic element uh, for those who attend. Although the organizers of these events are firmly against using that term because they, they can't use it since they aren't actual certified uh, therapists or, or recognized healers. They're simply moderators who create this experience. So the space. Um, in general, in Paris, the sessions happen in rooms of studio yo of yoga or other um, bodily or spiritual practice for well-being. However, if the facilitators have an apartment or a home where they can accommodate a large group, then they'll do it there. Uh, the red tents are framed by a very ritualistic, oriental, Buddhist aesthetic, if you can say it that way. Most of the circle meetings uh, we attended were held in the evening, so it was dark outside. And the atmosphere of candles, uh, the smell of incense, uh, sage, the presence of strangers really contributes to the activation of a certain ritualistic 
a feeling, um, a perception of what will happen next. So women who don't know each other will come at the appointed time and the host offers herbal tea, often yogi tea, at least um, here in Paris, uh, to create a relaxed atmosphere. The room is very dimly lit. The women greet each other with a slight smile. Everyone is a little tense and shy at first, so they stay for a bit uh, waiting for every, everyone to arrive while the facilitator may begin chatting with some about previous tents or other spiritual events in the area. And then at the specific starting time of the circle, the facilitator will notify everyone that it's time to start and invite them to sit down on a meditation cushion or a yoga pillow. Um, so these cushions are usually, uh, uh, so it's usually uh, meditation pillows or yoga bolsters, and they may be embroidered with Hindu, Buddhist, or other motifs. Um, and these colorful meditation cushions are laid upon a red carpet or a fabric. As a matter of fact, red is a very present color in this scenography. The women are invited to come wearing red as a symbol and celebration of sacred femininity and sisterhood unity but rarely do they ever actually come dressed um, as such. Red fabrics are installed though on the walls or perhaps to hide furniture for the yoga studio or, um, or the couch if you're in someone's home. And the walls of the space that I usually go to are white but adorned with this large uh, Buddha, Buddha face <laughs> carved in wood. We are, there are also some tall wardrobes full of yoga blankets, etc. And the facilitator also had a big white dream catcher with crystals and rocks intertwined, uh, situated right over her head of the position where she was sitting. So as you can see, these are some of the, this is a kind of mood board of what you can see in a red tent space. The scenography is very cozy, the light is dark and the space is warm. It feels somewhat like a womb with all the red warm coloring and with the woman sat in a circle and the many blankets and cushions around it. The facilitator will ask each woman if she's comfortable and each participant can then personalize the space by picking up a cushion or a blanket. So the, this, uh, these elements also affect the acoustics of the space. Um, so the women will talk softly, sometimes they whisper or when they cry, if they sniffle. For example, the silence is kind of um, protected by these soft surfaces. There's no echo in the space most of the time, thanks to the cushions, et cetera. Uh, there are candles in the center of the circle that provides a feeling of warmth and it adds to the sacred ritualistic dimension of the experience. This dim lighting also allows the women to share and express themselves more freely as they're less visible. So their speech takes precedent over their physical features. Each woman is in this way, really in a sense brought back to her feminine essence rather than her social status or um, professional position, although that's another uh, subject entirely. So even if this space is somewhat personalizable according to the comfort and needs of each woman, it's impossible to break the shape of this circle, primarily because in the center there's an altar like you, like the one you see here. And depending on the circle and the theme of the gathering, you can see different objects in this altar. The most important element though is the candle and the red fabric or red tissue in the center. All these details contribute to the atmosphere of relaxation and also create a certain amount of trust between the participants and the moderator of the event. So there are also a certain amount of um, tools that are used to activate this uh, session. The red tent officially begins with a set of rules. And the most important rule is to respect the anonymity of the stories that are shared. Uh, the women are also not to comment or to interrupt what another woman uh, has to say. And there's uh, an object that serves as a kind of talking stick that is passed around. Most of the time, it's a shell or a crystal. And with these simple rules, along with this established aesthetic that's very recurrent in all these red tents, the, there's a certain feeling of a magic, of caring and sensitivity and a certain acceptance that kicks into the space. 
Yes, and once everyone is seated, each woman introduces herself and says what brought her into the circle and shares her inner weather, uh, the feelings she came into the circle with. After everyone has spoken, a round of sage cleansing ensues. The energy shower, so-called, uh, is presented here as a way to get rid of imposed roles of mother, daughter, etc. According to the host, it dates back to Native American tribes. So the facilitator will pass along a burning stick of sage, like the ones you see here, to purify the energy and cleanse us of our roles, as she said. So you close your eyes and then someone on the left or the right of you will have this sage and wand it around you. Um, and then when she's done, she'll whisper to you, welcome to the circle. And then you do the same to the next person. It is curious though, that the topics raised during the moment of sharing are very often linked precisely to these roles initially supposed to be purified. The speeches deposited concern the work, the relationship of the couple, the relations with the children, the questioning of their roles as a daughter, mother, bereavement, illness, important stages in life, uh, etc. But the most important role of the gathering is that in, is that is as a sharing practice, an exercise will well known by the researchers of uh, new spirituality in new age. However, it would be a serious error to consider that ritual beyond the aesthetic just presented. Even if sharing is the most important part of the practice, the core of it actually, there are some invisible links which are produced during this practice and this invisible mechanisms. Within the circle, participants uh, can share their thoughts, feelings, and be heard. These are spaces for women that nurturing the safe because they are without judgment, discrimination, and prejudice. And after presenting and sharing their indoor weather, facilitator announces the rules of the circle. And as we have already said, besides preserving anonymity and the rule of using the first person when speaking, the most interesting uh, for me, uh, rule is the following, not to have any direct relationship with the information that someone shared when you are talking. Uh, I see we are all mirrors, but we are not in this kind of sharing. Thus, it is openly emphasized that there should be no open discussion and no advice. Nonetheless, the stories often cling to each other, which set the tone to the whole discussion. So women are each invited to share for a specific amount of time. The facilitator may take out an iPhone <laughs> and set up a timer according to the number of women present, which is usually not more than 13. And it can be really a, quite a surprise to all of a sudden see such a modern object in such a, um, in such a aesthetic space. Um, of a symbolism and metaphor, it's uh, quite uh, jarring. And then you have a time allotted to hold the crystal and share. The women are invited to share actually whatever they, they want. They can sing, dance, or even say nothing at all. When the iPhone alarm goes off, it's then on to the next woman to share. And there's no dialogue or true direct exchange in that sense. Through the simple act of just listening, the strangers give a space and a time for the woman who is sharing to just really release anything. Mm -hmm. And now a few words about some outcomes of this practice. I suppose, um, for example, that the talking circle without bouncing around still offers women the possibility of associating with the speech of others. Time, formally divided into equal intervals between women is in fact entirely appropriate by each of them. Stories shared in the circle are rated on their potential usefulness to each of the participants. The most precious part of the ritual is the effect of the unique and fleeting mirror that is installed, installed during the talking circle. The articulation of pain, it's also a very interesting moment, uh, through stories serves as a sort of sign of the success and depth of the red tent. Besides the pain, the fragility of this space is due to the 
perceptions of what should or what should or should not be expressed in the circle and uh, the corresponding expectations of participants. The effectiveness of the circle has its limits. Speeches should not, shouldn't be neither too light nor too heavy. Embraced with the smell of burnt sage, the power of crystals, and the protection of the dimmed lighting, the women are more at ease to finally come to terms with experiences that modern day women will go through in some way. Experiences that I think um, only total strangers could really support you through with impartiality and a certain detachment, yet a feminine understanding that they also share from the common experience of womanhood. Perhaps it's only with complete strangers who share the same condition of being a woman, a true um, social handicap that you can share your deepest pain with. Sometimes the women will share stories of joy or of becoming someone new or of coming into themselves or releasing notions of womanhood that no longer serve them. But through um, our experience partaking in a few circles, those more positive uh, speeches are really quite rare. Well, the devices that influence the creation of the atmosphere and the production of these links are both the formal tools of discipline and the discourses that are participants uh, that participants present. In particular, the talking stick not only acts as a docile listening instrument, but also activates thinking, which in turn goes beyond the circle frame and draws attention to everyday life. Another instrument, the timer, goes, also goes beyond its initial functions and is understood by the participants as the producer of meanings. And now we would like to say a few words about uh, feminist potential, real feminist potential of those circles and uh, make some uh, skeptical remarks uh, of... Uh, some points of skepticism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, Anita Diamond, the author of the Red Tent book, uh, believes that such gatherings should be in every neighborhood. However, is this a genuinely feminist initiative or rather an utopia? Ideas about um, who was the first woman to make a circle in France vary depending on who is speaking. In fact, in France, there are the Red Tents of Paris and the Red Tents of France, and their organizers, even if they know each other, still carry out their activities in parallel. That is to say, there are women who are responsible for a target audiences of a specific area and do not encroach onto the territory of others. For example, the tent of Paris uh, Boulogne is a part of the group uh, Red Tents of France, although Boulogne is usually considered as a part of Paris. Um, Camille Fès, the author of 2018 book, The Power of the Feminine, says that the Red Tents are a new kind of feminism. Uh, we know already that it's not so new. And uh, participants, by the way, have to pay for the circle, which really calls into the question their accessibility for all. Uh, the countercultural space uh, that is part of a movement meant to call into reality a new era, a new paradigm, is nevertheless not uh, disconnected from the market system. It can cost 15 to 20 euros to attend a red tent circle in Paris, which may be justified by the need to rent a space in a very dense city. But when the tent is organized in someone's home or via Zoom, the price stays the same. Of course, the facilitator does dedicate time and energy to organize these events, but this exchange of money creates a hierarchy and an unbalanced distribution of power or control in a space where all are meant to be welcomed and free to express themselves. As a matter of fact, the facilitator makes it a point to emphasize her status as being no different than the other women present in that she will also share some experiences just the same as the other women uh, partake in the ritual. So this payment creates a filter which is clearly visible when you're present at the circle. Rarely do you see students or 
um, women of color, people from low incomes. Another point that prevents the inclusivity of this space is its secrecy and its very difficult access. The red tents of Paris are presented almost like a sort of secret society that is not yet widely heard of. There's no pamphlets or posters. And if you wanna visit a red tent, as we already said, it can be really uh, complicated to get the foot in the door. Uh, these tents also happen in private spaces and are only for women. So what does this mean for trans non-binary people? Although the need uh, for non-mixed circles is clear, what do we make of those people who do not enter one strict definition of a gender? Furthermore, these meetings in private spaces, a space often associated with the woman, as in the kitchen, the home, the womb, et cetera, are, um, are women not again being brought back to the cliche vision of a woman in a patriarchal society? Yes, and uh, among the dissatisfactions evoked by my informants, there is a concept of sorority, which is widely present in the discourse around the sac sacred feminine and the red ten, but which nevertheless has nothing to do with mutual aid, which would go further than listening to others for two hours once a month. True relationship rarely are formed or continued outside of this space of red tent. After the moment of the circle, the women are invited to share a few snacks and a tea before going off back into the modern city, back to their roles that society gave them. Um, so this is the time when the women can connect, but they're not allowed to bring up the stories that were shared during the moment of the circle unless invited by the one who shared that story. And uh, at the largest scale, it's also a feminist criticism of this kind of initiative, which already has a rather important history. The accusations of essentialization of women have been thrown up, according to the authors, at the same time as the so-called spiritual feminism goddess movement in the 1970s. As a matter of fact, some may find this space encloses women even more in the biological condition of womanhood, uniting them through a symbolism so deeply attached to menstruation, uh, which brings us to a question, you know, what about the women identifying people who don't feel a need to talk about or connect with their period or who don't menstruate? And um, the ideas behind this space connect women to an idea of femininity of the womb figure that just doesn't include all women. So this space, as you can tell, brings up a lot of questions on inclusivity and accessibility of spaces of speech that could in fact be beneficial to all bodies regardless of their gender identity. It's interesting to see the potentials that this space uh, presents, but how could we rethink it in a way that is constructive, inclusive, and accessible? So that's kind of our starting point maybe for this Q&A if you want. And just uh, before getting to that, we wanted to just um, we have a bibliography that you guys probably already have. And we also um, most recently published the Women Journal, Volume 1, where um, uh, Sasha, Alexandra, and I wrote articles on this topic of the red tents. And we decided to uh, um, give you guys uh, the cohorts, an excerpt of this journal so that you have a little more information about the red tents. But please don't share it if you can just keep it <laughs> in the cohort. <laughs> okay, I'm sending that email now so everyone can have it. And here's our contact info if you guys want. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Chloe, Alexandra. Um, and yeah. Let's jump into questions. So the first one is, yeah, uh, David. Hi. Um, so my, I guess I have two questions. One would be, um, what would be your advice to men in general or like, yeah, men in general uh, about um, how can we approach our divine feminine and how can we grow it? and and go, like find that connection, number one. And the other question was about exactly uh, what, what you came to the end of the of the talk about transgender, what other uh, identified as woman, transgender woman specific, how how would they fit in into rituals that have to do with uh, 
with the menstruation, um, not in the red tent in a specific, but in general, uh, those are my questions. Uh, yeah, those are, thank you for your questions, David. They're definitely very on the, very poignant. I don't know, do you want to say something? Uh, maybe about, uh, about the first question, I would say the best way to, um, uh, for my opinion, to develop your femininity is to uh, read more and be engaged more in feminist initiatives or read more about feminism because uh, the more you um, enter into this discussion, this topic, the more you accept the um, variety of forms of expression you may have and so you will have less uh, shy uh, to to express your and develop actually your feminine uh, side so i think it's it's not very direct line but uh, i think it actually works through feminism and uh, about the second question i'm don't know maybe chloe will answer this um i don't know if i'm uh... Uh, I forgot what was the question, how to include men in, or the question of trans people. Um, yes, it's, yeah, it's so still a question. <laughs> it's still a question. That's the thing. That's why we have some skepticism around this space. Um, I, for example, developed, started developing the woman cave space as an alternative in the sense that it was the idea of bringing this red tent experience in the public space to have all forms of all types of people and genders talking together in a public space where it's free and accessible for all. But that's also kind of uh, difficult to do. It's also not always easy to get really different kind of people together in the same space to sit down and talk about these subjects of um, you know gender identity and, and um, spirituality really also. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what we're still researching, I guess. If you have any ideas, David, we would love to hear them. <laughs> but yeah, it's something to develop. But that's what's interesting. Afterwards, um, uh, I do think it's very important that non-mixed uh, circles exist. I think it is important to have spaces where um, people who usually aren't given space to express themselves or be heard do have a chance to do that. Afterwards, um, there are uh, there are non-mixed circles for men, actually. And I think there are more and more um, exceptions. I mean, more and more maybe flexibility uh, to take into account people who don't enter those binary definitions of gender, perhaps. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, David. <laughs> uh, Kayla. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is the, is the Red t Tent move its movement specific to Paris, or is it just your the experiences that you've had that, um, that you're speaking of that happened in Paris? Yes, sure. Um, I think we mentioned it maybe in passing, so it's good to say that uh, the Red Tent is a kind of global movement, which was inspired as an American author, Anita Diamond, with her book, and uh, it appeared first in the United States, I guess, and then in 2008, it was, uh, it, it appeared in Paris and France, and we uh, have this experience of uh, <laughs> Red Tent in France, yes. but it has, it's a part of this, uh, it's, the main, it's the same idea for Red Tent, uh, uh, global red tent. Yeah, it's it's really a global movement, and even you can see that with the fact that there's a TV mini TV series on uh, from inspired from that book as well, which kind of tries to show you what this space is. So it's definitely a worldwide movement. Even um, in the articles that we sent uh, published in the Women Journal, um, Alexandra actually did some research on red tent circles in Russia. So um, it's interesting to see the commonalities and the points that stay the same. And then also to see the different um, origin stories of the red tents that they come mm. up with according to where you are in the world. Um, but there are usually some common 
common, common things points, yeah, yes. to all common of them. symbols common common books uh, which circulate in this uh, in this sphere so the language even yeah. aesthetic language and uh, oral language <laughs> used is like also quite common cool thank you thank you I also think this uh, response to Francisco's uh, comment, right? Ah, we didn't look at the chat. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it was not really a question. I, I was just answering to Kayla mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I know that there are many other movements. Some of are more blatantly like a business than others, but yeah, it's like they appropriate different cosmogonies and the, to tell a different story about these very uh, same kind of practices. But yes, th th it was not really a, a question, but thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, uh, just as a suggestion, there are websites that kind of try to show you where um, in the world there are red tents. And when I was searching before, you can find a red tent group in on every continent. And then afterwards, you can go into every country and try to find one in your region. There are actually a lot. And then afterwards, for other events more related to New Age, of course, there exist tons of them. But I guess you could say that the Red Tent is kind of a subgroup under New Age. Yes, yeah. uh, this is the case. That's why you maybe it's better to say it's, it's a part of this more uh, wide movement of New Age or New Age culture, New Age uh, media than uh, the branch of who was first, <laughs> who was uh, uh, second, who mimic uh, who, because it's really difficult to, to define actually uh, today because it's so fluid, so it circulates uh, because of internet, uh, we can appropriate any idea and uh, incarnate it almost everywhere. Okay, uh, Jessica. So what makes the Red Tent events different from like a feminist consciousness raising group? Do you know? What the I have no <laughs> idea about feminist consciousness raising groups. How? What is that? But it's very interesting. We have to. We have to. Could you tell us really what... quickly, like what happens in a feminist consciousness raising group? It's a, it's like a thing that started in the sixties and it's a bunch of women get together with like different definitions of what a woman, is, who a woman is mm. um, and talk about societal issues, gender oppression, all mm. that kind of stuff. Um, mm. So it sounds like the difference is um, that the, that the red tent isn't really about having a sort of engagement or um, political act of a sort in the sense that, at least from my experience, the women who are there aren't necessarily feminist or aren't necessarily, um, I don't know, from any specific similar political background or, or engagement or stance. And it has nothing with sharing that position, positionality. It's more about sharing your personal experience and there's no discussion, there's no back and forth. You just have 10 minutes to say whatever you feel. <laughs> yes, and actually among my informants, uh, as in Russia, as here in Paris, there are some women who are scared of word feminism and they're scared of being identified as feminists. Even if, uh, if we look really, really precisely on this movement, it can be almost uh, identified to ecofeminism, uh, for example, which is also the, but it's another story, but it's, it's quite curious have, have, how so many groups uh, exist at the same time, but in Red Tent, it's very interesting this, uh, the women are really, sometimes really scared of word feminism. Mm. Yeah, that's actually what's kind of funny is that, I mean, I don't know, I find it kind of funny that when you see a group of women doing something together because they share the fact that they're women um, as a commonality, people have a tendency to say, oh, they're feminists. Mm, actually, those two things are totally separate. You can be a woman um, doing things uh, yeah. because you're a woman and they're women too and be totally not feminist at all or not, you know, politically politically engaged or mm -hmm. so um yeah it's 
And I guess it's, it's very different from the feminist consciousness raising groups, which we will have to look into. Yeah, and, and it's a really good uh, article about this of uh, Woodhead and uh, Sointra, I think it, it is in your bibliography about this, why actually women go to uh, those kind of groups. It's, uh, and we, if we see, if, I look, if we look precisely the portrait of uh, these women, they are quite far from uh, feminists. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and, and another thing too is actually in this circle, when you start to talk with them about inclusivity or about other forms of economy, for example, um, they they don't really have seem to be having a big uh, self-critical view on it. And when I before talked to some facilitators about uh, what what would we do if someone who is trans wants to come or or why are there only white women here? It's not really a question that they ask themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I think we have a yeah, one more. Ah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Rachel. Or, or kind of. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I agreed with a lot of your skepticism around um, the movement. I found a few a few things slightly problematic about them, like even the name I think is slightly <laughs> problematic for some women. Um, and I also like the crystal thing, I have a slight issue with due to like the problematic nature of the crystal industry and like the mining around crystals um, that a lot of people don't seem to be aware of. I wondered if you could just talk a bit more about like any specific ideas you had on like how these kind of groups could progress because I think like, you know, conceptually it's a great thing, but more specific ideas of like how, how these, how they could grow or like become more inclusive. Yeah, so that's basically the work that I've been doing for the past few years as an architect um, by creating the Woman Cave space, which you could say perhaps the name might be problematic for some, but it's really, a question of approaching this topic of um, of how do you talk with people about gender uh, without scaring them off? And our hypothesis is to make it fun and humorous and like uh, auto dérisoire, uh, make fun of yourself while doing it. So the woman cave is a spinoff of the man cave, which is an American term that probably most of you know. And it's just kind of, uh, the idea was to create a nomad space that we could quickly install in public spaces to activate discussions and moments of exchange. And it's really interesting because where you think that, um, I mean, we've activated a few discussions in the space in, um, in, in uh, social settings where you would think everyone already has a good enough background around sociology and inclusivity and design, et cetera. And actually it, um, a, a lot of men feel attacked um, and feel um, unsettled by the subject. So it's, I don't know, it's, um, it's interesting, at least with the Women Cave Collective, we try to create moments and spaces where people can share and also where we recognize everyone's experience and everyone's speech as valid. That's very inspired by Donna Haraway. I don't know if you read her work on situated knowledge. Um, that to us is very important. And um, yeah, I think that's also something that's interesting in the red tents that we would like to continue moving forward with is the idea that your experience can be a form of knowledge for somebody else and can inform someone else's um, thought processes and decisions, even if it's not academia with a big A. So that's something we've been working on. And then, yeah, I don't know, I, I guess just what's kind of an interesting takeaway is that, you know, people want to design objects or design spaces, but maybe what's really productive for society is to just design a moment where two people who are very different, from very different backgrounds uh, can just express themselves without I don't know, getting punched in the face. I mean, <laughs> like just have two really different people disagree while still being welcomed. How can you do that today? So that's what we're trying to do. Afterwards, I don't really know any other examples. No, I mean, neither. I, did, I didn't have time to <laughs> explore that. I, I was so focused on my red tent. On her. <laughs>
but yeah. Here, I, I just want to make sure that Kayla, uh, I mean, she had a, a second question. And I don't, I mean, I think it's been, oh, we, we oh, yeah. briefly talked about how wide this mm. movement is, but Kayla. Oh, I was just curious if anybody addresses the cultural appropriation that happens within the red tent movement. Um, uh, um, address, fin, parle de, I'm mm. translating. <laughs> <laughs> um, touche sur ça. Mm. Sur le truc d'appropriation culturelle de mm. red tents. Mm. 